Let's go ahead and get started for the morning. I do want to introduce the two presenters who are going to welcome you here to this uh, morning's event. I want to, uh, two of them actually probably don't need a whole lot of recognition here, but or not recognition, but a whole lot of uh, uh, introduction rather. Uh, we have Governor Cecil Andrus, the president of the Andrus Center for Public Policy at Boise State University. And you may remember he's a four-term governor here in the state of Idaho and Priscilla Salant, Salant. She's the director of the James A. and Louise McClure Center for Public Policy at the University of Idaho. So, please welcome Governor Andrus and Priscilla Salant. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome. Uh, Governor Little, members of the Idaho Legislature, distinguished guests, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Uh, I'm going to take just a moment or two uh, for comments that uh, of, of welcome and, and thanks. I'd like to thank you for being here this morning. Uh, thank you for giving a day of your life for the studies that we hope will enhance the learning opportunity for children in the state of Idaho. The, uh, the education and well-being of, the, of children uh, here or anywhere else uh, is an issue that transcends, transcends the ideological aspect that, that prevail in some areas. It doesn't prevail in this subject matter, and we're fortunate for that. Now, one of the greatest gifts that we can provide for children uh, is that of a good education, all children, not just the, the privileged few. Uh, and that's why the University of Idaho and with the McClure uh, Center and Boise State University with the Andrus Center have come together this morning in order to, to helpfully develop and utilize those success stories that you're going to hear this morning. Uh, one thing that we know, and one thing that has to be corrected, is that uh, young children in Idaho enter, too many of them, enter kindergarten unable to even recognize uh, their letters or the sounds that accompany them. Uh, that means that they, when they go to kindergarten, They've got, to, they've got to start fresh. They've got to start from scratch while some of the other children are already moving into to reading. Uh, we also know that children who uh, start out behind often stay there. And if they have not progressed uh, to the right level by the third grade, uh, we find that uh, they're the ones that are apt to drop out, the ones that may not graduate from high school, and those that... Uh, uh, won't even have the desire or the opportunity to attend college. So issues like preparing young children for success and beyond, uh, they aren't red and blue issues. Uh, they're issues that Idaho parents and communities uh, want to address with collaboration and uh, utilization of all ideas. So that's why uh, we're here this morning. Now. Jim McClure and I were friends, uh, colleagues in many, uh, on many issues. During the years, uh, we worked together on, on many, many fronts. And here this morning, we have another opportunity to do just exactly like that. We need to do that, not do that now, just like we did in years ago. And now, uh, regretfully, uh, Jim is no longer with us. But his wife, Louise, still carries the banner, still makes certain that uh, she and her friends and colleagues in the, the McClure Center uh, continue to, to use all of their energies to enhance the quality of life in Idaho for children. And Louise is with us this morning. Louise is here, and I'd like to have you join me in welcoming her, Louise McClure. I'm the short one. 
My name is Priscilla Salant, and I'm the director of the McClure Center at the U of I. And just one sentence of background on the McClure Center, which will help explain this collaboration. Consistent with the Senator and Louise McClure's vision, the McClure Center conducts policy research and supports public dialogue on issues that matter to Idaho. And early childhood development is certainly one of those issues. So we are very honored to partner with the Anders Center on this event today. Um, the Anders Center approached us last September about working with them on this event. And I have to admit, to be honest, I was a little skeptical at first. We had never worked together before. And I have nothing. <laughs> I, I have nothing but good to say about the Anders Center and their staff. It has been wonderful working with them. They bring things to the table that we don't have and vice versa. That's how we need to address the issue of childhood development in Idaho. Um, so um, the two centers together have a common goal today, and that is to support a nonpartisan dialogue about learning opportunities for Idaho's young children beginning at home and continuing in all the settings in which children find themselves today, young children. Um, early learning is not a new issue in Idaho. Our conversation today builds from work that has been done in the past several decades. Um, one I'd like to just call out is some foundational work by um, the Albertsons Foundation in the late 1990s. In 1999, they hosted a conference called Start Smart, the New Brain Research and its Implications for Idaho's Young Children. That was followed by several legislative proposals um, in, in the state capitol um, that, didn't, that didn't come to fruition. But 15 years later, the momentum towards addressing this policy issue is building in Idaho, as I think you'll hear today. So today's event is a collaboration not only between U of I and BSU, but also among our planning committee members, Idaho Business for Education, Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children, Idaho Public Television, and Transform Idaho. And it's also a collaboration with our generous sponsors, Bank of the Cascades, City of Boise, St. Luke's Children's Hospital, Oppenheimer Companies, Idaho Public Television, Idaho Business for Education, and the Womack Foundation. I'd like to ask you to thank our sponsors for today. And so this collaborative effort has turned out an extraordinary crowd today. The room is full. There's hardly enough room to get between the tables. Um, just let me tick off a few of the organizations that are represented, uh, represented here today. The governors and the lieutenant governor's office, state superintendent of education, legislators, representatives of the school districts, the Idaho School Board Association, State Board, Idaho um, PTA, City of Boise, Department of Health and Welfare, Idaho Commission on Hispanic Affairs, Labor, the Commission for Libraries, the YMCA, and the list goes on. It's quite a crowd. So um, we, the subtitle of today's event is Finding Common Ground. We've set up this program in a, in a way that we hope will identify the priorities that you have from all your different perspectives, you're the priorities for policy on early learning. We hope to find the ones in which there's some general agreement and step back from, as Governor Andrews said, the red and, uh, and blue ideologies that so often divide us. So I encourage you to ask questions and make comments during the day we've set aside time in the program for that. Couple of housekeeping issues. Please pick up and complete the ev evaluation form on your table um, and leave it for volunteers to pick up at the end of the day. A reminder to those who registered for continuing education units, you need to um, sign out at the front desk to get those uh, units for the paperwork. And lastly, if only my kids could hear, for social media folks out there, our hashtag today is for our kids. So thank you, and I'll turn it back to Erin.
Governor Anders and Purcell will hear from them a little bit later here in the program. One of the things I'm notoriously bad at is introducing myself. For those who don't know, my name is Aaron Coons. I'm the one of the two co-hosts of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television. And of course, as you probably know, if we cover politics, it's uh, not outside our realm to cover what's happening here in the state of Idaho about education. Our next presenter will be our Lieutenant Governor, the 42nd Lieutenant Governor from the state of Idaho, Gov Lieutenant Governor Brad Little. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I, uh, Governor Andrus and Louise, uh, thank you for putting this on. Uh, it, it appears to me that you've got most of the right people in the room to get something done. If you don't have the right people in the room, you got the people in the room that'll get to the right people. So uh, congratulations. That's always a great way to start. And I've looked at your program. You've got a great program, great speakers, great panels. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be very successful. They said there's an evaluation form, so the shorter I talk, the better my evaluation will be, um, since uh, I will just uh, demonstrate my ignorance. Uh, what I know about early childhood is uh, our grandkids. Uh, our grandkids are all pre-K at this point in time, and uh, for Teresa and I, it's a marvel when we see them every couple weeks, the changes that are taking place in their lives, and it just emphasizes how important what you're going to do here <coughs> uh, today. Your panel, you've got, you're going to learn the best practices from several of the states that have been doing this for a long time, and that's always a good place to start. And how those best practices apply to a state as diverse as the state of Idaho, uh, because we are a very, very diverse state. Uh, so from Idaho, uh, from the state of Idaho, a very sincere thank you for showing up today, for being concerned uh, about fulfilling Idaho's constitutional obligation, but more important, our moral obligation to educate our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Little. Um, okay, let's go ahead and start uh, with our presentations for today. Now, a quick reminder that on your table, there are some question forms that are uh, there for you to fill out, and if you have some questions for some of our presenters, like the one that we're just about to announce, uh, write those out, and once you get those filled out, please put them, put your hand up in the air with that, and we'll have some volunteers coming around and picking them up, and then when the presenter is done speaking, we'll have a question and answer period with a, I will moderate, so that's how you get that done. Our next speaker is Dr. Noreen Womack, who's been practicing pediatric medicine here in Boise for the last 15 years. In 2013, she was recognized as the Idaho Pediatrician of the Year by the Idaho Chapter of the American Association of Pediatrics. And in 2014, she was awarded the AAP's Susan B. Aronson Award for her significant contribution to improving the health and the safety of children in early education and child care settings. Please welcome Dr. Noreen Womack. This is not intimidating at all, by the way. I do this all the time. So without any further ado, let's talk about the science of learning. So to begin with, this is what we're going to talk about today, for most of today, right? What is going on in the brain of this baby? And for a long time, the answer was thought to be that there's not much going on in the mind of this baby. And the reason why we thought that was, well, look, here's a newborn baby. That's my husband. This is my firstborn. Look how floppy they are. They can't even hold their own heads up. Um, they're completely dependent on their parents for everything, right? Um, they, all they do is eat and sleep, and they feel dirty in wet diapers, and that's pretty much it. And it is true that the brain of a newborn is very underdeveloped. In fact, there are other animals in the animal kingdom that have better developed brains than a human baby has. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to which of the animals that are shown here have a better brain as a baby than a human baby does? Ooh, we've got a smart crowd in here. That is correct. All of these animals have better developed baby brains uh, than a human baby does. 
But that really should strike you as odd, right? Why would human babies have the least developed brain of the entire animal kingdom? Well, to answer that question, we're going to compare a baby chick and a baby crow. First, let's take this baby chick. So a baby chick hatches out of its egg, and within several weeks, it is completely independent on its mother and its father. It is able to walk around, peck for grain. Uh, it doesn't need any help at all. So let's. So that's the baby chick. Let's take a baby crow. So a baby crow hatches out of its egg, and the first thing it does is open its mouth or open its beak, and it expects its mother and its father to drop insects, grubs, etc., into its mouth day in and day out. And does anybody want to hazard a guess as to how long this baby crow is dependent on its parents? So two years. So in certain species of crows, these baby crows are dependent on their parents, both mother and father, for two long years. And why would that be? That What, what is the advantage of that? Well, here is a picture of a new Caledonian crow on the cover of Science Magazine in 2010. And the reason why this crow made the cover of Science Magazine in 2010 is because it is very, very smart. Here you can see this crow using this twig, putting it in this hole, because it is it is learned, it is figured out that if it does this, that eventually there's going to be stuff that comes out of that hole and goes up the twig and he can eat it. And so scientists love to study crows because they are so intelligent. So that is, what, that is where our baby crow ended up. Where did our baby chick end up? That's right. So that is the answer to our question of what is going on in the brain of this baby? Childhood is for learning, and it turns out, this is um, Dr. Allison Gopnik's work, it turns out that the longer your childhood period is, the more intelligent you are as a species. And humans have the longest childhood of all of the animal kingdom. The, the childhood um, for human beings is 18 to 20 years, which is by far the longest childhood. Yes, it depends on the child, of course, right? <laughs> So all a baby pig can expect, even though it has a better developed brain at first, all it can expect to do is become an adult pig and maybe bacon, right? But my son, who can't even hold his head up yet at birth, can be capable of many great things. Alternatively, and really this slide makes me shudder, other things can happen too. So humans are c capable of great things and not so great things. And we're gonna talk about how to make the difference later. So here's your take home message. And this is a statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And that is, um, the first 1,000 days of a child's life offer a critical window for social and emotional attachment with rapid brain development does not, that does not occur at any other time. And there are three parts to this the fact that it's the first 1,000 days, right? Because we talked about childhood being the first 18 to 20 years, but it turns out the first 1,000 days are some of the most important. And this rapid brain development cannot occur without social and emotional attachment. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And the reason I included this fetal ultrasound is because that first 1,000 days actually also includes pregnancy, so the 40 weeks of gestation. So um, this is a website, uh, Center on the Developing Child out of Harvard, and it has a lot of great uh, videos and materials. And so if anybody wants to do any extra research, this is a wonderful resource. And I'm going to play you just one of the two-minute videos that comes from this website. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace, 
and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So how do we know all of this? You know, first we didn't think that babies did very much, and now we're all the way to knowing that the first 1,000 days were the most important. And part of the reason why we've come so far in the last several decades with our research are modalities like this. This is a magnetoencephalogram, and it actually works on quantum theory. So we weren't able to have this sort of technology until very recently. And Dr. Patricia Kuehl is the medical director at the Science of Learning at the University of Washington in Seattle. And she has one of these magnetoencephalograms that was donated to her by the Bezos Foundation, and you guys might know Jeff Bezos um, from Amazon, so he's the founder of Amazon. Um, and this particular magnetoencephalogram that Dr. Kuehl has is actually modified for infants and toddlers, so this is really, this is one of the reasons why research has really exploded recently. So in this first several years of life, there are 700 new synaptic or neuronal connections made every single second, and this should strike you as a lot, right? 700 <laughs> per second is pretty mind-blowing, no pun intended. Um, and to the point where, at the end of this period, there are billions of synaptic connections made, billions. Um, at the end of this period, by the time a child is in kindergarten, the brain has reached about 85 to 90 percent of its capacity. And I'll say that again, because that's, that's also crazy. So by the time a child reaches kindergarten, it has reached 85 to 90 percent of its brain's capacity. After the age of seven, if there's any skull growth, it's because of skull thickening, not because of any further brain development. Here is another way to look at the exact same thing, and all of you parents in this room should recognize this chart, or your pediatrician or your family medicine doctor is not doing their job. Are there any other doctors in here? <laughs> oh, good. So this is a Center for Disease Control growth chart, um, head, head circumference um, for boys, birth to 36 months. We only check head circumference in the first several years of life because that, again, is when all the growth is occurring. And when I show this graph to, to families, I say the reason why we do this is because this is a crude measurement of brain growth. So um, checking the head circumference is one of the ways that we check and make sure that the brain is developing properly. And I want to point out that in the first year of life, look at the slope of this curve. It's almost straight up. And then as a child gets older, between two and three years of age, this is the slope right here. So again, another way to say the same thing, that this is really where the brain is happening. Or I should say when. So we talked about all these billions of synaptic connections. What's happening with these connections? Well, one of the most important things that's happening is language. So. Um, most children, their first word is by the first year of life, right? So when they're 12 months of age, usually they have their first word. And the most common first word is dada. And for all the moms in this room, I just want to say that dada is easier to say, it's easier for a baby to say than mama. <laughs> so anyway, that is usually the most common first word, unless your family does not speak English. If, if you are raised in a family that's Spanish speaking, what is your first word? It's papa. And so even with their first year of life, with their first word, you can tell that these kids are already discerning between languages. Again, Dr. Patricia Kuehl at the University of Washington has done a lot of original research on this. 
Um, and what she's found is that your language proficiency is highest not only in the first several years of life, but before the age of six months. Um, and I just want you all to take a moment and look at your age on this graph, um, if it's even on there, because mine is not. And it's a little depressing, right? But even before six months, this language proficiency is happening. And we know this not just from research that Dr. Kuhl has done, but for instance, in hearing impairment, we know that, and we just discovered this by chance, that if you identify a child who has hearing impairment and correct it, either by hearing aids or cochlear implant, before the age of six months, then there is no delay in speech and language development. If we don't catch it in time, or it's an acquired hearing loss, then there actually will be speech and language delay almost all the time, even if they're only seven to eight months of age. The other thing kids are doing during this critical time period is not just language, but also uh, learning social and emotional or nonverbal cues. So Dr. Alison Gopnik is a professor of psychology and philosophy out of Berkeley, and she did some really um, interesting uh, research as well. And what she did was she took 18-month-olds, and she sat them at a table, and she put two bowls in front of them. And one bowl had broccoli, and one bowl had goldfish crackers. And then the investigator would sit on the other side of this 18-month-old and pick up the broccoli and say, mmm, this is really good. I love broccoli. Yum. And then it would take the goldfish crackers and say, ugh, yuck. And it is true that most toddlers do prefer goldfish crackers, right, more than they prefer broccoli. So then after the investigator did that, they would say, give me a snack. And so what did the 18-month-old do? He would kind of look at them funny, but then he would take the broccoli and hand it to the investigator. So what that's telling you is that that child is picking up on those nonverbal emotional social cues. Then Dr. Gopnik took 15-month-olds, did the exact same experiment, and guess what the 15-month-olds would hand to the investigator? They would hand them the goldfish crackers because they, they had not learned those social emotional cues. So even between the ages of 15 months and 18 months, there's something happening there. There's connections being made where children are becoming citizens, they're becoming social creatures, right? You know, we like to think of children as being egotistical, which yes, they are, but um, they, they do understand um, where other people are coming from, or how other people think, and this is one of the ways that we've been able to elucidate that. So in summary, we are the smartest, arguably, we're the smartest creatures on the planet. And the reason why we are is we have this prolonged childhood of 18 to 20 years, and our brains start off as a, as a clean slate. We waste no brain circuitry at all to survival in our early years. And because we do not waste any brain circuitry in the beginning, we're able to create from scratch all of our neuronal synaptic connections, and that is a key to creating a unique and reasoning mind. So Dr. Michael Rich, um, who's a pediatrician um, at Harvard, um, does a lot of work in this area as well. And there are several things that he's found that the human brain needs in order to develop properly. Uh, one of those is free play. Uh, another one is learning how actions affect their immediate physical environment. But, and thirdly, and probably most importantly, children need to feel safe. That is one of the things that they absolutely need or they cannot grow and develop. And one of the ways that they feel safe is by serve and return interaction. And so those of you in the know in this room already know what that means, but for, for the rest of us, serve and return interaction basically is interactive face-to-face -face time with an adult. And so one way to think about it is if somebody hands you a four-month-old baby and you're holding the four-month-old baby and the baby's looking at you and you're looking at the baby, what do you do? Almost automatically what you do is you smile, you make faces, you coo, and guess what the baby does? Does the exact same thing back. That is all serve and return interaction is. And it sounds pretty simple, right? But it turns out this is very, very crucial. And um, this next video um, will show not just serve and return interaction, but what will happen if you do not have serve and return interaction. Babies this young are extremely responsive to 
the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I really like your hair. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening with you? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, wh why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It only took two minutes, right? Um, that, that mom was still looking at that baby, but it wasn't enough. There was no serve and return interaction, and it only took two minutes for that baby to react so negatively. And, you know, you, you take that two-minute time period where that child was not getting serve and return interaction, um, and you think about how that might be happening in other, you know, right here, right now in Boise. Um, and um, to take an extreme example of this, um, lack of serve and return interaction. These are um, pictures of um, a Rom Romanian orphanages um, back in the 1900s. So there was a, uh, a communist dictator in Romania um, in the early 1900s um, who decreed that all childbearing women had to have five kids for the state. And uh, the, the, ch the couples who were not able to have children were actually penalized. And so it was very encouraged to have lots of children. Well, what happened as a result is a lot of children were born, but the families were not able to take care of them, and so a lot of these children ended up um, as wards of the state. So they were in these orphanages, even though they weren't technically orphans. And by the time this came to light and communism fell in Romania in 1989, 1990, um, there were upwards of 50,000 of these children that were wards of the state. And when the world found out about this, uh, there were a lot of these children that were adopted out, including here in the United States. Uh, and um, as tragic as it was, it was actually um, a, a unique way of, of looking at what happens if you take a child out of that sort of environment and then put him, put him in a loving home. And it turns out that if the children were adopted younger than four months of age, then they adapted without any difficulties. Over four months of age, if these children were adopted, even in loving families in the United States, uh, they were lifelong problems. Um, they had developmental delays, they had cognitive deficits uh, that lasted. Um, they had anxiety, depression, um, they, they ended up having more maladaptive behaviors and, and ended up with more adult um, heart disease, stroke, um, cancer, et cetera. It's quite tragic. Um, and the, the word for this is toxic stress. And toxic stress is beyond the scope of my talk today, um, but certainly deserves just mentioning um, because it's basically the antithesis, antithesis of serve and return interaction. Because usually when you have toxic stress, it's ongoing, right? In the cases of like child abuse and neglect. Um, and toxic stress, think of it as post-traumatic stress disorder, which is bad enough in an adult, but if post-traumatic stress disor disorder is happening in a child, 
whose brain is developing, just think about how much more damaging that is. And we know that toxic stress can disrupt brain architecture, increase neuronal connections dedicated to fear and anger, and prunes away connections that are dedicated to reasoning, learning, memory, and emotional regulation. And I see this play out. Anybody who's ever worked with these kids who are subject to toxic stress have seen this in action. This is a child who comes from multiple foster homes. When I go to examine them with my stethoscope, just reaching out to them with, with my hand, they flinch back just automatically. It's just a reflex for them. So um, in summary, servant re return interaction is necessary so that social and emotional attachment is necessary um, for this rapid brain development to occur. And this is one thing that there is no app for, right? You cannot uh, recreate this in the screen. In fact, there is an uh, AAP policy statement that says you should not have any screen time for any child less than two years of age. Um, and there are a lot of awesome studies actually done by um, Dr. Rich that show that children don't learn from screens under two years of age. Um, and, and just a little piece of trivia about screens in general. So despite the fact that we have all these different screens now, TV is still king. TV is still number one. And almost 100% of you know, um, the homes in the US have TVs. Even the homes that don't have running water have a TV in them. So why is that all of this important, or is it important? Well, I would argue that it is. So here's a graph that shows barriers to educational achievement. So here in the red line are um, the vocabulary of children who have college-educated parents. In the blue, working-class parents. In the green, welfare. And so some people call this the word gap, where there is a gap in the, the number of words that um, a child says. And as you can see, as the age goes up, um, this word gap increases. So wouldn't it be cool if we were able to take these two lines and make them the same as this one, right? Wouldn't that be neat? And there are people, um, such as myself, that think that there are ways to do that. And one of them is with high quality preschool. And a lot of you in this room um, already know this, but this is one of the landmark preschool studies um, that we have and, is, and it's often cited. And the reason why it is unique is because they really followed these subjects for decades. So the way the Perry Preschool study worked is that in Ypsilanti, Michigan in 19, early 1960s, I think 1962, they took 120 at-risk kids. And when I say at-risk, um, I mean kids who were in um, families that were on welfare or who had, um, were from single family homes or there was um, household substance abuse, et cetera. So they took 120 of these at-risk kids and they divided them in half. And 60 of them went to a high quality preschool and it has to be high quality. I'll just put that little plug in right there. Um, and then the other half were the controls. And then they went on to uh, watch these children and um, collect data on them for upwards of 30 years. What that showed in a nutshell is that Yes, there were, there were program costs to the preschool because high quality preschool is expensive. But then they reaped the benefits because the kids that went to this preschool were, spent less time in special education, which is expensive. Uh, they were more likely to graduate from high school. They were more likely to have uh, jobs that earned more, um, so higher wages. They were less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system, either as victims or as perpetrators. Um, and they were less likely to be on welfare. And so you might think, well, that's wonderful, but you know, why can't mothers do this at home? And the answer is they can. They can do this at home, especially if they've got guidance. You know, not every mother has um, all of this um, um, information on um, how important early education is, but they can get it, right? It's readily av available. Um, but here is the reality. The reality is that two out of three women, at least nationwide, send their infants to out-of-home daycare when they return to work. I was one of them. I had six weeks of maternity leave with both of my kids. And so this is the reality we live in. And so then the question becomes, where are these children going? Do we know where they're going? Are they going to these quality programs? Are they going to grandma's house? Are they going to a neighbor? Um, do the parents take turns um, taking care of them. So that's, that's a question I think that's going to be answered later today. So I actually got this from my son's teacher. 
welcome to kindergarten. And so this kid's saying, you're telling me it will take 13 years to install my education? What kind of outdated software is the school using? So there is this connectivity, I think, um, and this is the way I, I think of it. And so everybody knows about the Albertsons found Foundation's um, Go On campaign, right? We, we are encouraging our high school graduates here in Idaho to go on to do some undergrad education. This is a really um, big push, and it's been a very successful campaign. I would argue that you're going to have more success with this sort of thing if you graduate more high school students, right? It just, that's just common sense. And you're going to graduate more high school students if more of them are proficient in reading by third grade. And that also is a fact, that if you are proficient in reading by third grade, you are more likely to graduate from high school. And you're going to have more kids proficient in reading in third grade if they were prepared for kindergarten and they were, had a successful kindergarten year. That also makes sense, and it also has been shown in studies. And again, um, you're going to have more success in kindergarten if you had some sort of basis or foundation in your education. And, and we're not talking about learning how to read in pre-K. We're talking about the wanting to learn, like learning how to learn. That's what you're learning in pre-K. Um, like, like he mentioned, I've been uh, practicing here in the Treasure Valley for 15 years, and one of my favorite things to do are kindergarten physicals. And one of the reasons why is because it's such a magical age because they believe in magic, right? I mean, kindergartners, you know, you, a parent tells a kindergartner that there's a um, old fat man that's going to come down their chimney every year, and they just believe it. Um, you tell them that there's going to be some large bunny that comes and puts eggs in their yard, and they just they believe it. And, you know, teeth means money underneath the pillow. I mean, sounds crazy to an adult, but they believe these things. Um, and the, the other thing that they believe in, if you tell them often enough, is they believe in themselves. Because one thing I didn't mention um, is that, you know, again, by kindergarten, 90% of the brain has reached its capacity, but one of the other things that's happened by that age typically is a child's sense of what is possible in life. And so at a kindergarten physical, if you quiz a child on their literacy and their numeracy, you know, what color is that, and they get it right, and what's this letter, and they get it right, and you look at them and you say, oh my gosh, you're really smart. They believe you. They believe that they're smart. Like, you are really going to be ready to learn by kindergarten. And they take that and they assimilate it. And if you're told that enough, they believe it and it becomes true. Um, just one little, uh, a few things about third grade. Um, and I actually learned this from um, my friends in the field of education, that third grade is pivotal. And the reason why it is is because um, before third grade, you're learning how to read. Um, you're learning reading proficiency. That's what the IRI is all about. How, you know, how many words can you read per minute? You're learning um, reading comprehension. So not just how fast you can read, but are, did you understand what you just read? Um, and then after third grade, you have to know how to read in order to learn. So um, before third grade, you're learning how to read. And then after third grade, um, you're reading in order to learn. Um, and so there's a lot of studies around third grade um, and future success. Uh, for instance, um, it is a known fact that if um, you are proficient in reading by the third grade, that you're um, not likely to be involved in the criminal justice system when you're older. In fact, there are several states that forecast how many prison beds are going to need in the future by third grade reading scores. So again, why is this all important? Um, so the, the current United States statistic is that we're number 24 out of 65 developed countries when it comes to literacy, and it's even actually lower. We are, we are ranked lower when it comes to STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and math. And that did not used to be the case. We used to be on the top. And again, we already talked about how several states forecast needed prison growth based on third grade reading scores and that how children who read by third grade seldom are ever involved with the criminal justice system. Um, and this is interesting. I didn't know this um, before I researched it, and that is the United States is the number one jailer in the world. We have the most prisoners per capita of, of all the developed countries. And out of all the folks that are sitting in the U.S. prisons right now, 71% of those did not graduate from high school. So this is a big deal. It's not just about education. It's about workforce, it's about 
um, keeping people out of jail. Um, there are 10 million unemployed people, approximately 10 million unemployed people in the United States, but there are 4 million jobs that employers in the United States are not able to fill. So this is um, research done by Dr. James Heckman. Dr. Heckman is an economist. Um, he's considered one of the um, most influential economists of our time. Um, he won a Nobel Peace Prize for um, economics. And this is a study he did um, about 10 years ago where he looked at, you know, if you invest money, where are you going to get the most bang for your buck or ROI, return on investment? Um, and what he found is if you invest here in preschool, your return on your investment is higher than if you do it for later in special education, et cetera, and job training. And I'm going to read this little blurb right here um, by Dr. Heckman. The most effective strategy for strengthening the future workforce, both economically and neurobiologically, and improving its quality of life is to invest in the environment of disadvantaged children during their early childhood years. So this was a pretty powerful study. Um, and currently, um, we know that before kindergarten, that's when 90% of the brain development is happening. Um, and we know that currently we're, we're expending about 1% of resources on that time when there's 90% of that development happening. So just a few words on adult learning, since this is a talk on learning. Um, we are less open-minded to new ideas and more resistant to change. And I'm hoping for the ones in this room where this is new information that I'm presenting that it won't be the case. <laughs> And I've actually already violated one of the cardinal rules of adult learning, which is I've already droned on for more than 18 minutes. So that's why TED Talks are 18 minutes long, right? Because we know that the adult attention spans about 18 minutes, which means I've probably lost most of you already. Um, so it, the other interesting thing that I learned is that the attention, attention span is actually decreasing, and now it's closer to an average of about 12 minutes. Um, and uh, it, it's easy to see if you just go to the movies, right? You go to a movie today and, you know, it's it's almost too much, you know? It's just like bang, bang, bang. You know, they're changing the scenes. The dialogue's really short. Everything's quite fast-paced. And then you look at a movie or run a movie from 30 years ago, and it's all about dialogue and um, it's a lot less fast-paced. Um, does anybody here know what vining is, video vining? So I learned this from one of my teenage patients. I had no idea this was going on. And vining is, uh, vining is, are six second videos. They're only six seconds long and they, they, they're on a loop and they go over and over and over again because you know what? If you cannot get the attention of a teenager in six seconds, it's not worth it to them. So they, they don't even do YouTube anymore, it's too long. They, they do these vines that are six seconds long and it just, it's mind blowing really. So we use personal experience as a resource, um, which actually can sometimes be a detriment um, because Dr. Gopnik, um, the professor out of Berkeley, calls children the R&D branch of, the human, of human beings. So the children are the ones that can think outside the box because we're bogged down by our personal experience um, in our frames of context. So here's a question. This is, this is a graph that I made. So here's what we've learned from research, right? So, you know, we didn't think babies thought at all, you know, just kind of floppy. And then more and more, we're learning more about this time period in children's lives. And what is our response to this? It's down here. Again, this is not scientific. Uh, and, and different people learn at different rates. Um, and, and there's some people that are really responding to this quickly. Um, China um, has decreed that uh, they're going to have, um, by the end of a certain period of time, three years of preschool. That's, that's what they're aiming for. In Western Europe, 90% um, of their children um, attend quality preschool. Uh, here in the United States, it's something like less than 50%, I don't know, something like less than half. And there's about 9% here in Idaho. So here's this gap here, and what are we going to do about it? And I think that's what we're going to talk about today, right? So quiz, talk about adult learning. It gave me an idea. Um, raise your hand if you can remember that take-home slide, all three parts. Raise your hand if you think you can do it from memory. Carolyn. One 
slide I asked you to remember. One slide. Okay, I'll give you that. So this is your prize. You get a brain. <laughs> oh, thank you. So that's, that's right. So the first 1,000 days show rapid brain development that does not occur at any time, and it cannot occur without social and emotional attachment. Very good, Carolyn. So one last thought, um, and this is, um, I'm going to paraphrase paraphrase from my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, and that's 100 years from now, um, which is 2115. It will not matter what kind of car I drove or what kind of house I lived in or how much I had in my bank account or what kind of clothes I wore, but the world may be a better place if I was important in the life of a child. So one of the things we're going to decide today is what is our legacy going to be for children. Thanks. All right, Dr. Womack, thank you so much for your presentation today. Really enlightening. And again, I'll remind the folks, you do have your question slips are on your table Fill those out, put your hand in the air, and a volunteer will come around and pick those up. We do have a couple of questions, and we have, what, about six, seven minutes in which to ask uh, Dr. Womad a couple of questions if you uh, are willing. And I guess the first one I guess I'll come up with myself, and that is I'm a parent, and I have a, a one-year-old in my household. I have a five-year-old. One's in, in pre-K. Obviously, the one-year-old is, is just learning how to have fun in life. So the question as a parent for me would be, at what point should we start introducing uh, the skills of reading to my one-year-old? Yeah, th these are on. Go ahead. And that's, a, that's a very good question. And actually, this is what I mainly spend my time doing, and that's reading and literacy. And um, to answer that question, six months. Um, we ask parents, families, to start reading to their children at least 20 minutes every day starting at six months of age. And I usually get crazy looks like uh, my, my six-month-old can't read. But not only are you introducing the books and words and pictures, but that is actually a form of serve and return interaction because un un unlike putting them in front of a TV, at that age, they're on your lap, right? Because you're trying to get their attention because their attention span is really short. But, again, if you at least try to read with them 20 minutes every day starting at six months, um, that, that's when you start introducing literacy and reading and pictures, et cetera. I was really surprised when the hospital didn't give me a, an instruction book but for, my, for my daughters. <laughs> but another question from the audience comes in and asks, uh, why do you think Idaho has only 9% in preschool? There are probably people in this room that can answer that better than I can. Does anybody want to um, answer that for me? I, I um, my, my first reaction to that, and again, this is not because I don't know a lot about this area, but, you know, my children went to preschool, and if you can afford it, um, most people will put their children in preschool, and I was able to afford it, but it was expensive. It was very expensive. For a high-quality preschool, you know, it costs a lot, and so um, I can't imagine, you know, if, if we struggle to, to do this, um, then I can't imagine how, how big of a struggle it is to find and afford high-quality preschool um, for most of children, most of Idaho's children. Here's a good question. If a child doesn't have much interaction with an adult before they're age three and then goes on to a quality preschool, is it possible that they can catch up? Absolutely. You know, I talked, um, just because of my short um, uh, time frame, I, I, I spoke a lot um, in generalizations and extremes, but absolutely they can catch up. Um, we didn't talk about resiliency. There's some kids that are just naturally, naturally resilient despite their situation. And you can actually teach resiliency too. So even um, if somebody was, for instance, um, subject to abuse and neglect in their early years, but they attend a quality um, preschool, 
then, then they can actually be taught resiliency. And there are actually some, um, there are studies going on right now, including in Washington State, where there are at-risk uh, uh, children who are in quality preschools and are actually teaching them resiliency and seeing how they do later on. Uh, the, a question I think a lot of parents have is if, the reality is a lot of, a lot of households have both parents working. Um, how can they work with their children if they're spending a lot of their time to just put food on the table? That, that's very difficult because, you know, I, I've experienced that myself. So um, you just have to make the time. Um, there are um, something called the five R's that the AAP uh, recommends, it, and you can do it even if you're a busy family or even if you're a single parent home, and that's, you know, establishing routines. You know, you can do that. Um, you can still read 20 minutes even though your day is really busy. 20 minutes is not that much time. Um, you have to remember to um, talk a lot to your child. Um, reward your child, because I always hear that time out doesn't work. A lot of kids don't get time in, so you want to give that, um, uh, you know, things like that. So there, there are ways that you can overcome that, that time. Okay. Uh, another uh, question from the audience. Uh, what, reading what reading skills should children have when entering first grade? Ah, and again, um, the educators in this room can answer that um, better than I. Um, again, it, they, first of all, they, they have to want to learn. They have to feel like they can learn. That's number one. Um, they want to have, they, they, they need to think that they're smart and can learn. That's, that's important. Um, if they have that, uh, then if they just have the basic um, recognition of the letters um, and some of the sounds, that's pretty good. Um, and a kindergarten teacher worth their salt can take it from there and get them reading at least sight words by the end of that year. Okay, we have time for one last question, and this one is uh, something that came to me as well, but this one's from the audience. Are math skills just as important to introduce at a young age as those reading skills? Yes, so numeracy is uh, important just as literacy. Is there more studies that um, associate literacy with IQ and um, you know, later uh, success in school? Um, but again, I think there's more and more um, recognition that numeracy is just as important as literacy, and I think that's come about because a lot of the jobs, the, the big jobs, um, come more from STEM, which is more the, the mathematics and engineering models. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Womack. Thank you.